Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. So uh, I've been working at the National Nanotechnology Laboratory, also known as Lanotech, for the last year, uh, part-time. The other part-time I also work at the University of Costa Rica. So all the projects that are going to be discussed here are actually public funding, uh, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So this is actually my first ILSI meeting. It's also the first time that Lanotech comes to an ILSI meeting, so I want to tell you a little bit about Lanotech before I start the content of my talk. So uh, uh, as Jorge said, Lanotech is the it's a uh, national research center in where we study and develop micro and nanomaterials. And we have a cross-disciplinary staff of 10 scientists that include chemists, biologists, and even a mechatronics engineer. And uh, our mission is to be a bridge between industry, government, and academia. And we also offer analytical and consultant services. We have uh, very high-tech equipment to be able to make nanotechnology uh, products and also analyze them. So we have some major clients that include medical device companies, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and agricultural and biotechnology businesses. So uh, the research programs at Lanotech can be categorized in three main branches, and they include studying at the nano and micro scale, the biodiversity of Costa Rican flora and fauna. So for instance, in this picture you see is a optical microscopy of a uh, hummingbird feather. And actually the color from uh, hummingbird feathers is not a pigment, it's actually a structural color, which means the color comes from nano and micro scale um, morphologies. So one, one of the works that has been done at Lanotech is to try and study at that level of scale the origin of such color. Um, we also at Lanotech care about adding value to waste products, and I'm going to talk about one of these projects, but one application of using waste products is to be able to generate nanotechnological materials that can be applied for instance in the pharmaceutical industry. And finally, we also have produced and analyzed advanced materials. These surfboards that you see here were actually made, uh, they're biofriendly, they're made from a polyurethane foam that was created from a vegetable source. Okay, so let's start talking about nanotechnology and let me first remind you what a nanometer is. So I think everyone remembers that a millimeter is a thousand of a meter and a micrometer is a thousand of a millimeter, and a nanometer is a thousand of a micrometer, so it's very small, 10 to the minus nine meters. To give you a daily life example, a grain of salt, a grain of salt is about 100 microns, which is 100,000 nanometers, and nanoparticles are about one to 100 nanometers, so we're talking about at least a thousand times smaller than the width of a grain of salt. And when you're at that scale of size, some properties are different compared to their bulk counterparts. So for instance, silver nanoparticles happen to be antimicrobials, and there are a couple mechanisms on why this is. One of them is, if they're small enough, they can actually penetrate the cell wall of bacteria and go inside the cell and do all sorts of damages that will lead to the death of the cell. Also, just the fact that they're so small means that the surface area to volume ratio is very high, and that leads to a very high concentration right around the nanoparticle, so that when it adheres to a cell wall of bacteria, there will be uh, silver one ion, high concentration that can enter the bacteria and also cause all sorts of problems. This is not gonna happen to the same extent if you have microparticle silver, for instance. So there are many applications to nanotechnology in uh, many industries. You, know, you're you can also change spectroscopic properties, so absorption of light, emission of light. Uh, but I'm going to focus mostly on applications of nanotechnology to the food industry. So according to the European Food Information Council, here are some applications of nanotechnology. Uh, includes better packaging. Um, safer utensils, new formulations, and other applications. At Lanotech, we also consider that uh, 
making nanotechnology products from waste material is an application, and also using waste material as reagents for biosynthesis of nanotechnological products is also an application. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on work that Lanotech has published in the last couple of years, uh, work from my colleagues that has to do on value-added products. And I'm also going to talk on my own research that I started um, last year on bio-inspired bactericidal surfaces, which we think also has location for the food industry. So our goal here, since we're new, is to introduce ourselves to you and see what strategic alliances we can form in the future where a materials chemist group can help the food industry. Okay, so let's start by talking about nanocellulose. As you know, cellulose is a major component in plants. And it happens that if you're able to just isolate the, uh, the cellulose from the plant or plant residues and then cut it to the nanoscale dimensions, um, it actually has a lot of interesting properties. Uh, you can use it as a reinforcement material because it has very good mechanical properties and make uh, consumer products that are stronger than usual. You can use it in pharmaceuticals for drug delivery purposes. You can use it in the food industry as a fat substitute. And I, I've seen an application where people are using it to make ice cream that melts slower. Um, so at Lanotech, we looked into pineapple peel residues. So Costa Rica is one of the um, major exporters of pineapple in the world. There's a lot of residue, including the pineapple peel. That it's usually just used as a fertilizer for the, for the next harvest, right? But it actually has good content of cellulose and it can be turned into nanocellulose. So through a process that involves uh, chemical methods, me mechanical methods, and the, the chemical methods include both basic hydrolysis, oxidation, and then acid hydrolysis, you're able to remove everything that's not cellulose and then cut down the cellulose to a nanoscale size. And what my colleagues noticed is that the final hydrolysis step, this uh, acid hydrolysis step, is the one that determines the final size of the, of the nanofibers. And if you don't do the final hydrolysis, you'll get uh, <coughs> fibers that are about 100 nanometers in width. By the way, this is atomic force microscopy images. Here you have dimensions in the y and x axis, and then the color is defining the dimensions in the z axis. So the, the width of the fiber, or the, or the height of the fiber, is, is shown here. So when you um, do hydrolysis for about 60 minutes, now you have fibers that are about 25 nanometers. And that's actually already a very good size if you want to use this as a reinforcement filler because the mechanical properties are going to be uh, optimized. So we had a civil engineer student come to the lab, and he adapted the protocol that my colleagues had come up with to um, op optimize the yield, the recovery yield of the nanocellulose. And he applied it to the pineapple stubble, which is the, the leaves that are left over when you cut down the pineapple during the harvest. And he got nanocellulose, and then he mixed it with cement to try and improve the mechanical properties of cement. So here is measurement of resistance to torsion, which is where you make the cement, you mix it with a little bit of nanocellulose, and then you pull on it from both sides and see uh, at what pressure it's gonna break. And what he found out is that regardless of the aging time, so the time it, uh, after you prepare it and you leave it and then you measure it, there is an increase of 10 to 15% in the resistance to tension uh, which is also sort of independent of the percent of nanocellulose added. So here you see at three days it increases here, at seven days it increases, at 28 days it increases. So this is very good because at the same time the compression properties did not suffer any negative consequences. So it looks like now we have better cement. Now we still have to look at other properties to before we start using this to build houses. We need to see um, water permeability and some other properties, but it's very promising. A related project is uh, this one, which some colleagues looked into the pineapple peel again, and they realized that there was this silica microparticles 
They were not the first to discover them, but they were the first to fully characterize what's happening there. So there are the silica microparticles that uh, provide support and mechanical resistance to the peel of the pineapple, right? It's very hard to peel the pineapple. So during the process of isolating the nanocellulose, these microparticles are getting concentrated and they become very easy to analyze, actually. So here is a zoom by scanning electron microscopy. And what you see is that they're like five to 10 micron size rosette-like silicon uh, oxide microparticles that are composed themselves by even smaller microparticles, right? It kind of looks like a blackberry to me, but at the micron scale. So what is this good for? Well, um, similar microparticles are actually used already in industry to absorb heavy metals or to use as catalyst support because they have a high surface area at the volume ratio. But the advantage here is that you're, create, you're not creating it, you're just isolating it from nature. And usually to create these things, you have to use non-chemistry methods to come up with these very small particles. Okay, um, moving on to another project for my colleagues. You remember I was telling you about the silver nanoparticles as bactericidal agents. Well, usually these are made using synthetic reducing agents such as sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride is a toxic material. You have to be very careful when you use it. But it happens that um, some plant extracts like mint and yerba mate actually have enough sugars, polyphenols, and amino acids that are oxidizable materials that can reduce the silver ions that are used to create the nanoparticles and at the same time stabilize the nanoparticles as they form. So as you can see here, you get nanoparticles that are about 50 nanometers in width the size distribution might not be as tight as when you use the synthetic reagent, but these are nanoparticles that actually work as bactericidal agents. Here you see that they're effective, effective against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Uh, the reaction chemistry is also a little bit slower, but you know you did a biosynthesis. You didn't have to use the re uh, synthetic reagent. Okay. So I'm gonna move to now uh, my projects, and maybe you met Javier yesterday. He presented a poster on this as well. He works with me on this. So let's talk about surface decontamination. And this is of interest not only for the food industry, but also for hospital setting. If you wanna sterilize a surface, you have these traditional options. Some of them are expensive. Some of them use toxic chemicals. And most of them are gonna lead to not permanently sterile surfaces. So there are a few challenges here. Can we avoid or reduce the use of some of these treatments? And is there a way to make the surfaces be sterile for a long time? It happens that nature, through millions of years of evolution, conferred bactericidal biostructures on some animals. For instance, the skin of the gecko, if you look at it under scanning electron microscopy, it has these pinnules and they're nanometric size. We're talking about micron height. They're separated about 500 nanometers from each other. At the very tip, they're 50 nanometers in, in width. Um, cicada wings as well, they have these pillars here, and uh, dragonfly wings, they have these sort of spikes as well. And the way this works is actually when bacteria lands on such topographies, they get mechanically stressed by the topography, for instance here, it's a, it's a cartoon, right? But the bacteria tries to move, gets stuck on the pillars, and it stretches. And that's stressful for the bacteria, and it's not gonna survive. It can even get to a point where the liquid comes out, and then it gets impaled. So terrible death for bacteria. This is not a chemical method. You're using just the morphology. So the skin of a gecko is made of beta keratin, which of course is not an antibiotic. The wings of cicadas and dragonflies are made of kitten, which is also not an antibacterial agent. So, so we thought, okay, well, can we, can we inspire from this and try to make surfaces that use the same principle? So we looked into ways to try to generate nanopatterns, such as this one, and we looked into anodization of aluminum because it generates uh, nanometric patterns, and this is a standard technique in the aluminum industry to, to protect it, so you protect it from corrosion. So you, the way it works is 
You first do an anodization of the aluminum that generates a layer of aluminum oxide, and it has um, this disorganized nanowells. It doesn't matter that they're disorganized because in the next step, you sort of uh, etch the aluminum oxide, and now you end up with these nanopores, and they're well organized. And then from there on, you do an, a second analyzation where you generate new nanowells, but this time they're ordered. And then in the last chemical edge, you can change the width of those wells. So we did that at Lanotech, and these are uh, the results that we got. And it does look very ordered, but it still doesn't look like the pillars or spikes that we want, but it's getting us close to that, right? Um, so we modified the conditions a little bit and did a lot of trial and error. And here is the result that we got. Here you can see pillars, they're sort of in this direction, and they're 150 nanometers in diameter and about three to 400 nanometers in height. Now, this material ends up being hydrophilic. It's alumina, right? So hydrophilic means that the water contact angle approaches zero. It means that you put water, and the water wants to wet the surface. Here is a picture of such a measurement. In nature, those structures that I showed you, they're actually usually hydrophobic, which means if you put water on them, the water doesn't even want to wet it. So we developed a procedure using a naturally occurring ligand to surface modify the surface and make it be hydrophobic, similar to the biological counterparts. And here you can see that the, the drop is actually very spherical because it doesn't want to wet the surface anymore. And the morphology of the surface suffers some changes, but they're not significant. OK, so does this actually work? Well, we started doing bactericidal action tests recently. These are still unpublished results. But the way we've been doing is we grow E. coli, and we apply it to the samples. Let's tend to 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the experiment we're doing. So you apply it on the sample. And then after 30 minutes, you remove it. You put it to grow in a nutritive media overnight. And then you see how many colonies grew in the Petri dish. We, we do some dilutions also. So what we have been seeing is that uh, our samples with nanopillars are growing 75 to 90% less bacteria than the control samples, which are just polished aluminum that do not have the organized nanotopography. If we looked at the scanning electron microscopy of the process of, of what's happening in the sample, we're seeing that the bacteria are kind of getting stuck to the pillars, which is probably the mechanical stress that we are looking for that will explain the results that we see with the colony forming unit test. A complementary technique is also to use fluorescence microscopy. You know, you're, you're looking at uh, surfaces that are not transparent. This is aluminum, and on top of it is alumina. So we ap apply, uh, apply the, a concentrated inoculum, and then rinse it, and then put a dye, and see how many bacteria ended up on the surface. So this is a dye that will show you all bacteria, acrid in orange. And what we see is that the control actually still has a lot of bacteria on the surface, but the sample doesn't have the bacteria on the surface anymore. And here is a replica of the process. Uh, when we look just at dead bacteria using a different dye, we actually see very little dead bacteria on any of the samples. So it looks like the dead bacteria are just falling off uh, after, the, after the contact time, which is good because it means we might be able to reuse the surface without having corpses of bacteria you know, it's, a, it's completely a surface technique, so we want to make sure that we have a pristine surface again. OK, so this is very promising for aluminum. But what if you don't want to use aluminum? What if you want to have uh, options on other surfaces? So we did an inverse replication method. We start again with the well-organized wells that I showed you before of aluminum oxide. And then we apply a medical grade elastomer, so a silicone, a flexible plastic. Uh, it's actually, uh, at the beginning, it's very, it's very fluid. And it flows into the nanowells that are present. And then you apply a curing step where it hardens. And then you mechanically separate them. And now you have a pattern elastomer. And the result looks like this. It's a transparent film. And if you put, if you put a double-sided adhesive, right here on the bottom of it. Now you can apply it to any surface you want. And you have a flexible uh, nano pattern material. 
So this is what it actually looks like when you look at it in the atomic force microscopy. Here is a template, the anodized aluminum. So you have the, the wells. And then when it replicates, it doesn't look perfect. But you, you do see, especially in the cross section here, you can see that there are nanometric size pillars, which are not very tall, and they're swollen. But um, we actually do see that it is working also as a bactericidal surface. And not only that, but actually you can keep replicating from the template. This is a replica from this one, and this is a replica from the same template. So you can reuse the template multiple times. And we're seeing 80 to 95% bactericidal efficiency tests in our preliminary testing that we have. And one advantage of this material is that it's already hydrophobic by itself. So it looks more like the, the biological counterparts. So um, the last approach that we have been using uh, is, a, is an even simpler approach. And it can be applied to many substrates as well. So we found in the literature that zinc oxide sometimes crystallizes in interesting morphologies. And this is one of them. This is actually an, an image from one of our samples. And there are these like, spikes or needles, sort of, that also appear to us to have potential of being bactericidal by mechanical means. So we found a procedure in the literature that was pretty simple. Um, basically, you start with a zinc salt and metallic zinc. And then you put it in basic aqueous medium. And if you leave it reacting for a little bit, then you generate this tetrahydroxy zinc complex, which uh, over time, it will saturate until the point where it makes zinc oxide. And then that zinc oxide can crystallize if you give it a sample on sur surface on which to deposit. So this is what it looks like on copper oxide, on, sorry, on copper substrate. We simplify the procedure from literature. They would usually precede the surface with potassium permanganate, which is a toxic material as an oxidant. So we got rid of that, and we did work for us. And then we move to surfaces that are even um, probably more applicable, like stainless steel. So in the last couple of months, this is the most recent project, we've been looking into how to control the size and morphology of those zinc oxide crystals. And what we have seen is that it is very substrate dependent and very time dependent. And when I say time, it's not only the time that you immerse the sample in the solution, but also when you take out the sample from the solution, how long the, does the solvent take to evaporate? That is also a very important step because you're, you're crystallizing the material. So on stainless steel, we're actually getting this other morphology. It looks completely different than the one on copper, right? Copper were kind of long needles that were even a, a few micron in length and very, very thin. But here, we're getting actually short, um, short fibers that are about 300 nanometers uh, in length and maybe about 50 nanometers in width. And they kind of look like knives to me. I don't know about you, but we, we call them nano knives. Um, so we, when we inoculate this with the bacteria, um, well, first of all, the, the colony forming unit counts show significant efficacy against E. coli. And at the same time, when we look at it in the, in the electron, uh, scanning electron microscopy, uh, we, it appears that the knives are sort of stabbing the, the bacteria. So we want to make sure that it's actually, that this is the mechanism of why it is working as we want it because there have been reports of zinc oxide nanoparticles that are usually smaller in size than what we're doing here, uh, acting by chemical means to be bactericidal. So we're trying to separate and make sure that we know how this is working. But this is also very promising. All, all of these projects that I told you are ongoing. We still have a ton of work to do. You know, we've been only doing E. coli. We want to move to Staphylococcus aureus, for instance. We want to scale up uh, many things. Okay. So to conclude my talk, I'm going to give you a few takeaways that I hope you remember when you go home. And it's that you can add value to agricultural waste, and you can turn it into nanoscale residues that actually have application in, uh, in uh, uh, any important applications, like I showed you in pharmaceuticals, in uh, <laughs> materials, and even in the food industry. And then you can also use agricultural waste in certain plants to either create nanomaterials or use it as replacement for chemicals that are used to create nanomaterials, such as those examples I gave you about the rosette-like silica <coughs> microparticles and the bactericidal uh, nanoparticles that are biosynthesized as well. 
And lastly, with my own research, I want to make sure that you remember that uh, nanotopographic surfaces actually have great potential to uh, benefit the hospital and perhaps even the packaging industry in, in food to make bactericidal surfaces. And there are many approaches that you can use depending on the surface that you're interested in turning to be bactericidal. So I want to acknowledge the Lanotech team, um, the director, and Melissa's work on pineapple, Gabriela's work on um, uh, bacteria, and Javier, the colleague that collaborates with me on these projects for surfaces, Reinaldo, that's very he's an expert in microscopy. Uh, I want to thank Hania Leon for inviting me to be here as well. And if you found any of these projects interesting, uh, and you want to come talk to us, please do. And we also hope that you come visit when you come to Costa Rica next year. You're certainly welcome to come and tour the lab and talk about challenges and opportunities where you think we might be able to help. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sergio. Questions? Chuck Saprinsky, University of Wisconsin. Very interesting talk. If I followed properly, you have some viable cells stuck to the lumen oxide surfaces. If you incubate those for longer periods of time with nutrients, will those grow out into biofilms? Yes, they will. Um, it, it, there's, there's, there's some experimental details that I kind of skipped through because it's very fast, right? But uh, normally we do a 30 second vortex to try and remove things. But for those experiments, we use higher concentrations of bacteria and then did shorter vortex times. So it's a little bit difficult to compare the, the plate counting methods with the fluorescence. But um, yeah, re removing biofilms, I, I, I agree, very important. And I'm not even saying that this is the final procedure that we're going to use to generate nanostructures. It's possible it can be even optimized. But yeah, our final goal is that you put the bacteria and you don't even let them grow into biofilms because you, you kill them when, before they get to that point. I'm Mark Mormon with the Kellogg Company. Uh, I'm from the great state of Michigan, and I can't wait to go back home and tell them to put pineapple into our concrete to make our roads better. So I uh, can't wait to take that home. I, I kind of want to pick up where Chuck was just going. Um, coming from the food industry side, my mind often goes to, you know, very often are we moving, um, I'm stepping away from the packaging application of the nanotechnology, but we're moving carbohydrates, proteins, fats, we're conveying these on equipment. And my mind goes to if I had a nanotechnology application of service equipment, uh, does, does, does that, do these macromolecules neutralize any of that antimicrobial property that's coming from the nanotechnology? Um, I, I just, I don't know what it means when we do studies that look at it in a salt solution and we find that it's very effective, but as soon as I apply that and I have these macromolecules, I'm wondering, is it still going to be effective as it's going to form a barrier, uh, perhaps even a, a biofilm, as Chuck was talking right, about. Right. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, this is why we're here, because I'm a chemist, for instance. Um, I know very little about the food industry. I, I don't know how the interaction is going to be when you have all this macromolecules there. Um, I would be happy to start sending samples to people if they want to start testing what happens. Uh, we're actually trying to scale up this year so that we have samples that are not this size anymore and that we can actually give out to people to try with their yeah. their systems of interest. Well, it's, it's very difficult to do it under, you know, plant applications because we have so many variables. I would just encourage you, and I'd find it very interesting, happy to talk with you more about designing some studies that incorporate certain amounts of proteins or fats or carbohydrates into these studies and ask a simple question. At what point do we see a decrease in, in efficacy of these coated particles? Right, right. Thank you. Uh, one, yeah, one thing I can say is that um, the, with the aluminum surfaces, it's actually sort of robust because it's the same material everywhere on, on the surface for, for a few microns. So even if you come and scrub it with a, with a sponge, 
it's still, after, after scrubbing it, it still has nanotopography. It changes a little bit the size, but the nanotopography is still there. And we, we have an experiment where we scrubbed, looked at it, scrubbed again, and looked at it again, and there was still the nanotopography there. So it, it seems to be somewhat robust. And I suspect it will be similar for the elastomer as well. So it, it might have more than, more than single use um, effectivity. Thank you, Dr. Shashu.